uh, first of all, I want to apologize for coming on to this webinar very late. I think I thought it was starting at 4.30. I missed the four o'clock. So my sincere apologies on um, the delay in starting us off. And I know this actually has a lot of effect on uh, the participation of different people. So my sincere apologies, Janice, for missing out on the time as uh, probably scheduled. So maybe I'll just put on my video briefly so that for those that we haven't met, we can try and put our face to the person who's speaking, but I will request that I switch this off so that I can be able just to focus on the presentation this um, afternoon, if that is okay. Is that okay, Janice? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay, so you'll allow me to proceed with the presentation this um, afternoon. So I was uh, requested to talk about the situation, the MR situation in the country, and also just take you through uh, what is happening at the policy level with respect to implementing the National Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance from a country's uh, perspective. I am sure uh, probably Janice was able to introduce um, uh, 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 to introduce me to the, to the rest of the team. I work at the Ministry of Health and I'm also the focal point for antimicrobial resistance. So I'll be sharing the country's journey towards um, implementing antimicrobial resistance and um, just give a bit of uh, background or a historical context, give an overview of the policy and the national action plan on AMR and what the implementation status is like because for every plan and every policy that is developed, it's important for the implementation to happen. Otherwise, it, it just becomes a good document that has been developed and, um, and really not eliciting any action at uh, the lowest level possible. And I think it's also important for me to be able to just take us through what the coordination and governance mechanisms look like at the country level for the policy on antimicrobial resistance. So I know by now we all understand that um, we are facing um, a silent pandemic when you talk about antimicrobial resistance. The emergence and the spread of AMR has several consequences. One, uh, in terms of uh, limited treatment outcomes. Number two, increase in terms of the costs of care. Number three, uh, possibilities of an increased, uh, increased mortality due to untreatable infections and definitely that affects um, economic outcomes at the end of the day. And I'm sure in our different interactions, we've tried to look at uh, what are the possible causes of AMR. And I want to make reference to Alexander Fleming's statement uh, during his um, Nobel Prize lecture in 1945. And he said that it's not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the lab by exposing them to concentrations that are not sufficient to kill them. And he said that uh, occasionally the same thing happens in the body. And uh, the danger, and that's where we are at now, that the ignorant man can actually underdose themselves by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, making them resistant. And this is what we are seeing happening now. When you look at the causes of antimicrobial resistance, we are seeing that um, some of the causes are uh, misuse and uh, overuse of antimicrobial agents. And when you look at misuse, and maybe you can just take time uh, on your chat box to just give some of the um, aspects that um, you think human beings are misusing antimicrobial agents. Maybe you can just type your answers and I will look at them later on as we continue with the discussion. So what are some of the ways that you think um, antimicrobial agents are misused? In what way do you think these are misused? And maybe you can just type on the chat box. I'll be able to see as we move on to the next slide so that it's not just a one-way lecture, but you're able to interact as well. Please feel free to use the chat box as we go through the session this uh, evening. What are some of the ways you think we are misusing antibiotics? I can see self-medication, taking antibiotics for common cold, sharing antibiotics, management of viral infections, and the brand puts management in quotes because 
really uh, viral infections don't respond to, um, to antibiotics. So you can see that those are some of the causes largely uh, that would result in resistance. Poor health seeking behavior, Michelle says, uh, Haseke says, used without prescription from a doctor, long courses in empirical management instead of targeted therapy. That's also um, some of the ways that we are actually misusing these anti antibiotics. So um, Alexander Fleming was, an, uh, was afraid that, that we would get to this moment when uh, after um, feeling slightly better, people will stop using their course of treatment and sometimes totally um, ignore that. And you say, I can see also we have underdoses or the treatment of viral diarrhea in children below one year with, anti, uh, with antibiotics, and this is really not necessary. So you can see all these actions can lead to the exposure of microbes to non-lethal quantities of this drug, and that is what is causing us problems now. And uh, during the World War II, many soldiers died out at war, and they died because of very simple infections like pneumonia or wound infections, because there was no cure for them. But when penicillin was discovered, and it was such a powerful drug, and the people, uh, the, the, fam the soldiers' families had hope. And you can see this picture that says, thanks to penicillin, he will come home. There are only two ways. If he gets sick or he gets a wound in the, in the, in the, while in the battlefield, you either die or recover. But when penicillin was discovered, there was hope that the soldiers would go back home because then they would find treatment that's effective. So if you look at um, uh, the aspect of it being a problem and um, the use of these antimicrobial agents has increased over the last few decades, we have microorganisms being exposed to a much larger number and a greater concentration of antimicrobials. There are numerous antimicrobials in the, in the market and this actually increases their chances of developing resistance too. It's a problem because there are very limited numbers of new drugs that are either under development or even being released into the market. And when they're released into the market, again, the cost is very prohibitive because um, the common man might not be able to afford that drug that has just been recently released into the market. And I, I like giving a simple example here. When you have um, an, an opportunity of using uh, two uh, uh, antibiotics and one costs 100 shillings for a full dose, and another costs 100,000 Kenya shillings for a full dose. What do you prefer and what reasons? And, uh, you, and as, as we speak, because of multi-drug resistance, there are those patients who really have no choice. They can't make a choice uh, whether or not they want to use the drug that costs 100,000 or the one that costs 100 Kenya shillings because the kind of microorganisms that have caused infections in their bodies cannot be able to be effectively eliminated with that antimicrobial agent that costs 100 shillings per dose, but they would require that one that costs 100,000 Kenya shillings per dose. And you can imagine how many of us can be able to afford that in terms of the cost of treatment. And we say the demand of drugs has increased because you have, an, you have increased resistance, but unfortunately, like we've said, the pipeline is running dry. And again, the research and development um, uh, pipeline is not attractive to people who are investors because you cannot have your return on investments due to the, the speed at which microorganisms are developing resistance to antimicrobial agents. So if my return on investment is not guaranteed and I've put in 10 years of research into a molecule that will have cost, um, uh, would have ceased to be effective against a microorganism within two years, then it doesn't make sense for a person who's investing in, uh, in pharma to invest in um, the, develop, the research and development of antimicrobial agents. So when it comes to tackling antimicrobial uh, resistance, we say AMR is one of those problems we call wicked problems because they have multiple root causes. So it's not just one aspect that's going to fix the problem, but you need different fronts addressed like awareness, uh, for example, what proportion of the public, for example, is aware that AMR is a threat when it comes to public health? What proportion understands that um, if antimicrobial resistance persists, for example, even their treatment to infections like malaria, HIV, TB are actually at risk? Sanitation and hygiene, and not just the public, but even amongst the healthcare professionals, we still have a lot of gaps when it comes to awareness. And when you talk about sanitation and hygiene and you look around the country and different settlement areas, 
how many people have access to clean water, even if they wanted to perform hand hygiene with the running water and soap, how many have access to clean water, how many have access to, uh, to, to, to clean uh, sanitation blocks, for example, and this is in communities and in schools as well. And you're also looking at healthcare facilities, are they able to adhere to these basic uh, requirements? So you're seeing challenges when it comes to the place of sanitation and hygiene. And I also, also just want to encourage you to feel free to interact on the chat box. If you have any questions or comments as I advance the slides, please feel free to raise those as well. And you're also talking about the use of antibiotics in agriculture and the environment. Think about the pharmaceutical industries. Where do they release their effluent? Does it go into rivers? Does it go into sewage systems? Is it processed? Does this also contribute to the emergence of resistant uh, microorganisms? And in agriculture, for growth promotion, the, in, in, in cattle, in chicken, in, um, in, uh, in pig farming, in all, and even in agriculture, how much an, of antibiotics are being used? And you're going to just see later on uh, how that is impacting in our um, agriculture and livestock sector. Then there's a place of vaccines and alternatives. And I know by now, because of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, you've all heard about all the vaccines, um, uh, those that are uh, uh, against uh, vaccination, you know, the anti-vaxxers, the pro-vaxxers, you know. What are alternatives do we have? And do vaccines have a place in terms of reducing the need for antimicrobial agents? And again, in the chat box, you can also tell us what do you think about the use of vaccines and alternatives in the fight against antimicrobial resistance? And I'll see that at the end of my session. Then we're also talking about surveillance. If you don't understand the magnitude of your problem, you will not be able to address it. If I don't know where the problem is, what part of the country, what kind of microorganisms are causing a problem, then even if I propose interventions, they might not be targeted and they might not be able to optimally um, decrease the emergence of resistance. And there's a place of rapid diagnostics. And you can see the, in the field of HIV and malaria, it has played a big role in, in supporting um, proper management of, um, of infections. For example, before we had the rapid test kits for malaria, anyone presenting with fever in a malaria endemic zone was suspected to have malaria and they would be given antimalarial agents. And within a very short time, we had resistance developing to uh, some of the antimicrobial agents that we, had, we, we are using. And I remember at some point, we had to change the treatment policy for malaria because um, the antimalarial agents that were being used prior to that point were, had, had actually shown resistant rates of up to 75%. Even in HIV now, within a, a few minutes, you're able to know your status. I remember the first time I tested when I was going to college, it took me like three days to get my results because it was a PCR. And um, it wasn't being done everywhere. It's only Cambridge that was carrying out uh, these tests. And, I, and you can imagine waiting for three days for your results, for you to know whether or not you actually are um, eligible to proceed to school or not. And the kind of, um, you know, the questions that everyone would be asking, what is this that is, is taking so long for it to be diagnosed? So you can see what rapid diagnostics have done in the field of medicine, just making sure that within a very short time, a clinician is well guided regarding the course of treatment they need to take. Then there's a place of human capital. Of course, all these things have to be done in the presence of technical, um, uh, technical uh, when you have technical expertise, you need competent healthcare providers. So you need uh, the right people in the right place. And I make reference and, um, to uh, 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 something that keeps coming up in, in a lot of the discussions we have when it comes to AMR and the, and the question about mushrooming clinics, mushrooming pharmacies, and we ask ourselves, who's behind these counters? Are they competent enough? So you need competent human capital to be able to uh, uh, um, effectively address AMR. And then you need a supply chain that is assured because I can have diagnostics, I can have the right people in place, I can have, you know, the, the public is aware, sanitation and hygiene has been addressed, vaccines have been addressed, but at the point of uh, delivery of my service, if the prescription lands in your pharmacy, and you tell your patient that drug is unavailable, you've actually broken the chain that's supposed to be tackling AMR. So we need to have a robust supply chain that assures good quality, affordable and effective antimicrobial agents at the end of the day. Then you have what we call the Global Innovation Fund that's trying to, uh, to uh, provide incentives to those that are in the pharma industry 
to encourage them to invest in the, in the research and development of newer molecules. And then International Coalition for Action, of course, we know that uh, without uh, partnership, really, none of us can be able to effectively tackle antimicrobial resistance. Um, so if I move on to the global response, uh, the call to action actually didn't start in 2014. As early as 2002 through to 2006, the WHO had already uh, started sending out some calls for action, but countries were slow in realizing that this is a problem that needed urgent attention. But in May 2014, during the World Health Assembly, and really the World Health Assembly is a gathering of all countries that are member states under the WHO. The WHO falls under the UN system of governance and um, it is uh, made up of countries. And these countries um, are normally referred to as member states. So decisions that concern global health problems are usually made at that high level um, at the World Health Assembly where countries come, they deliberate on issues that are brought to the table or are brought to the floor. And uh, they decide on the direction that each of the countries should take. So if it's a global health problem that affects multiple countries and they make global, uh, they make global decisions and they make um, resolutions that need to be addressed. And as you can see, this is a resolution that was made and they have executive boards that govern the processes of coming up with resolutions after member states have deliberated exhaustively on an issue. And the aspects they agree on at the end of um, a meeting are usually ratified at the World Health Assembly. So during the uh, executive board meeting in uh, 2014, you can see there was a resolution. And many times uh, during um, uh, the global discussions, you don't need all member states to, to bring an agenda to the floor. You can see this resolution has been proposed by just a few countries, but they bring it so that other countries, if they see that this is important, then they adapt it as something that can be taken up by, by the rest of the member states. So they resolved to develop um, a draft global action plan to combat AMR and to ensure that all countries have the capacity to combat AMR. And I want to emphasize on, on all countries because antimicrobial resistance cannot be contained within borders, unfortunately. If I get onto a plane and I'm carrying methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus on my hands and I move from Kenya, I go to India for treatment, it's so easy for me to transport a bag from Kenya to India and vice versa. I could have been in India because I went to seek treatment and I've been in the ICU and I end up with a uh, hospital or a healthcare um, associated infection that probably a, a patient con uh, contracted while in the ICU. And that infection is caused by a multidrug resistant organism. When that patient comes back to the country and if they require further um, management in the intensive care unit, and they are moved to an ICU within the country and that bug is still within their system. And it moves in through the ventilator that the patient has been put on. And another patient comes and uses the same vent. You can see how a mark can move across borders. And that is why it was important that all, all countries are actually prepared to take action against AMR. And um, the, 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 the basis was to take into account all existing action plans using any available evidence, because at that time, many countries didn't have data on the status of AMR. And number two, to, they needed to approach a multi, uh, to apply a multi-sectoral approach, realizing that AMR is not just a human health issue. So this was endorsed at the 68th World Health Assembly. And after May that year, all countries were given two years to develop their own action plan. So these are some of the cross-sectoral challenges, and that's why at the World Health Assembly, the discussion was that it must be multi-sectoral. And you can see for countries that have collected their data, like in the US, 70% of all antibiotics were actually consumed by animals and not people. And when this came out, I think everyone was baffled because we thought we were consuming more than uh, animals. And again, in the chat box, you can write, why do you think uh, animals are consuming more antibiotics compared to humans? And most, again, of these antibiotics that are being used are medically important for human beings. And the way they are being used in animals, again, is a big problem because you're not certain about, um, about the way they are used. And what we have seen is uh, the development of resistance 
to commonly used antibiotics in humans and uh, the, res the resistance is happening in animals. And that, uh, and the resistant genes can easily be transferred between the, the, hu the humans and the animals and, um, and vice versa, depending on how we interact with, our, with the animals. And you can see drugs like amoxicillin are on this list, which is very important. Erythromycin is also here. Lincomycin, you can see. Um, uh, you have uh, you have uh, a, a lot of the drugs that are in use in anim in human health also being used in um, agriculture and livestock, which is a big challenge. So, in terms of impact, if we don't change the way we are handling antibiotics. Um, at an individual level, I say that because that's where responsibility begins. Um, from the O'Neill report in uh, 2016, it's uh, projected that by 2050, 10 million people will be dying, dying annually. And I always um, say out of this 10 million, if you look at the bigger burden, the bigger burden is in Africa and in Asia. What are some of the similarities between Africa and Asia? And you can just put that again on the chat box and I'll revisit this at the end of the discussion. If you see, if you look at the big dot in Africa, it says 4.15 million people will be dying annually because of AMR. And when you look at our burden of disease, 50% of our top 10 causes of death are infectious diseases or communicable diseases that require effective antimicrobial agents. So in the absence of this, then what are we saying to our population that we will not be able to address 50% of their causes of illness when they come to a healthcare facility. I think that's quite a big challenge. And again, when it comes to AMR, we have understood that it is a shared responsibility. Right from the time that the executive board um, adapted the resolution to develop a global action plan, this was done from a, um, a multi-sectoral perspective. The WHO in collaboration with FAO, which is the food an agriculture organization and the OIE, which is an international organization for animals, all agreed that uh, they, we needed a global action plan. And it's out of this global action plan that Kenya began to develop its own national action plan on the prevent, prevention and containment of AMR. One of the things we normally say, as much as you have a global action plan, it is so important to contextualize any plans that are going to be borrowed or interventions that are going to be uh, maybe referenced uh, from a, a global perspective, because not everything can be um, implemented as is at a national level, at a county level, at a facility level, or even the farm level. Every intervention has to be contextualized for impact and ease and practicality when implementation. Um, if you look at the national context, so what guided our action plan? Before you develop any policy or any action plan or any strategy at a country level, you must understand your situation. And that's why we conducted a situation analysis, not once, but twice, just to be sure that we have the right um, background information to guide the um, selection of interventions that needed to be put in place. So we had... Um, Situation analysis first published in 2011, and we updated this in 2016 so that it reflects the situation by the time we were uh, coming up with a national plan. And what was clear from the situation analysis was that uh, AMR at a country level was being driven by prescribers and patient behavior. And again, when you have some time, you can just type on the chat box, what do you think from the prescriber perspective and patient behavior? How do we contribute to AMR from the prescriber level and the patient level? How does a weak health system contribute to AMR? Because these are some of the things that came out in the situational analysis that our health systems were weak. How does infection control contribute to AMR or reduce AMR? And how do technological developments also contribute to AMR? So for the next two minutes, I want to open up the chat box I uh, will discuss this a little bit before I move to my next slide. How do you think these four points contribute to AMR?
prescribers and patient behavior. Anyone who wants to type a response on how prescribers and patients contribute to AMR or would drive AMR up? Okay, I can't see any response. So I will move to the next slide until we have responses. So patients can demand for antibiotics. And I'm sure even yourselves, when you go into a pharmacy, you would actually go and ask for a specific antibiotic that you know. Uh, and Jenny says, prescribers give out antibiotics without a prescription. That's true, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Daniel says, patients pressure the prescribers to offer them antibiotics, yes. Brian says, prescribers not requesting for culture and sensitivity tests at a weak health system. Jemba says, misdiagnose, which is true. It's also part of the prescriber and the weak health system. And Jenny says, patients do not complete the dose of antibiotics, that's true. So you can see all these are part of the drivers, the things that drive AMR. Uh, what about infection prevention and control and technological developments? Daniel says prescribers misdiagnosis ends up giving wrong medication for wrong treatment sometimes may underdose. Thank you. Michelle says weak health systems create an imbalance between access and excess of antibiotics. That's true. Additionally, fake antibiotics get into the system. So you're talking about um, substandard, isn't it? Antibiotics. You're also talking about. Um, uh, uh, you're also talking about spurious, which is fake, getting into the anti into the systems and falsified. Something that is probably not for sale in a particular market finds itself within that market. That is true. Parallel importation is also a problem. That's a big problem when it comes to regulation. The use of antibiotics on viral conditions for unproved secondary bacterial infections like flu, that is also true. Thank you. Anything on infection control, advancement in tech, Google doctors and self-medication, big challenge. I'm sure some of you also do that. By a show of hands, how many have uh, sought Dr. Google's help? Let's be honest. You can put up your hand. Side has raised her hand. It's just one person. Who has put up her hand? The rest of us have never consulted Dr. Google. I have consulted Dr. Google as well. Now people are, are owning up. Michelle, I can see Daniel, the rest, Janice, Faith, Ian, Nan. Four people. We are now four. Is my hand up? But at least I've said so. So technological advancements are now one of our biggest threats when it comes to controlling that. And of course, if you have poor infection control practices, what you say prevention is better than cure. If you're not able to, if you, if you prevent an infection, then you will reduce the need for an antibiotic. But if an infection occurs, then you will definitely have to use that. Poor IPC, patients acquire super bags while admitted in hospital and might transmit this to the community. That is true. Okay, thank you so much for those great answers. So if you look at, um, some at the situation, and this was very interesting when we did the situation analysis in 2016, we wanted to look at the demand, the import data for six months. It, and this is for uh, looking at antibiotic use in livestock. And for six months, we had one particular drug that was leading the pack, oxytetracycline hydrochloride, 2.5 tons imported over a period of six months. And you can see all these other antibiotics, silosine, pen, pen, pen strep. You can see chlorotetracycline, penicillin, ampicillin, gentamicin. Some of these are used in, in human health. You can see all that doxycycline included. So, and we wanted to see where, where the demand was coming from. And we did some interviews in farms. Um, and you can see these are poultry farms in Thika, Gatundu, in Kisumu, in Kisauni, and Kwale. And you can see in um, about, you have, uh, you have five of uh, uh, about um, eight farms using oxytetracycline. So 
So that means that the demand actually comes from the users. And when you ask the farmers, they tell you every time we go to the pharmacy, uh, to the agrovet, we are told this is a multivitamin, just go and give your chicken over this period of time. Even day old chicken, uh, uh, chicks are given antibiotics to prevent infections that are not even there in the beginning. So you can see how um, the demand drives the imports at a country level. So when we saw that we had a challenge, we took a long time and because antimicrobial resistance is a big issue, the response at a policy level took time. And I share this because some of you will get to policy making level at some point in your lives. And it's good to understand that the development of policies is not an overnight journey. Your statement of the problem has to be very clear. There must be evidence that yes, this is a problem at a country level and can only be addressed by policy changes. And you can see even when you have scientists and researchers coming up with work and uh, findings and they have evidence that there's a problem, it takes time to move from, um, from research to, to, to policy. And you can see between 2009 up to 2017, when we had um, our national policy, that was about almost 10 years. And it just shows you that it is, uh, it is not an easy task. The situation analysis has to be clear. And in between, we had a change in terms of the governance at a country level, and that's when we introduced evolution. And, and with that, a lot of other things changed. And whenever you have a situation analysis, that doesn't mean that everyone will buy into your recommendations. You need to disseminate this information as, uh, as wide as you can so that people understand that there is a problem. And that's a place of public awareness. And um, finding points of entry that are going to be suitable. And when the situation analysis findings began to make sense at the policy level, then there was a recommendation to establish an, a multi-sectoral advisory committee between uh, the Ministry of Health and Agriculture. Then we had the appointment of focal points in both ministries. And then we adopted, and then we also had influence from other international uh, uh, events like um, the Global Health Security Agenda that was being led by the US and the International Health Regulation, which is, um, um, is, is a binding uh, a, a legal requirement for all member states to adhere to. And the international health regulations at that point when we were reviewing required the country to have had capacity to detect and report AMR. So when, when there's, um, uh, an, uh, there's um, like attention to an agenda from multiple sources, then it becomes easy to drive action. And then finally, we were able to develop our policy and launch it in 2017. So through the international health regulations that I've just mentioned, maybe you can uh, look it up later and just see the different scopes of work that it addresses, including how to address pandemic, pandemics at national and international levels. These are all addressed in that uh, international health regulations um, document. We also conducted a joint external evaluation to assess the capacity of the country and get the gaps. And uh, on AMR, we scored poorly, and you can see all the scores were twos. Capacity to, re to detect uh, resistance was at two. We really didn't have um, a centralized lab surveillance reporting system. Um, we were not able to, to also uh, document that we actually had antimicrobial stewardship activities going on at country level. So all these were gaps. And uh, by uh, and and you look when you look at um, the um, scores in 2017 and now these definitely big steps that the country has actually taken. So because of those gaps, we went ahead and formulated our national action plan. And you can see this was a joint venture. And like it states in the policy and the action plan that um, this is a multidisciplinary, intersectoral and global issue. The successful implementation of the action plan requires strong government commitment and collaborative actions across the sectors and also with international partners. And you can see this was signed by our uh, CS, uh, Dr. Cleo Pamailu then, and uh, Willie Bett from the Ministry of Agriculture, just to show commitment. And I want to say at this point that um, commitment from leadership is very important. If you have an agenda and your, your leader is not interested in it, you will drive it alone for a very long time and it will not move. 
But the moment leadership picks on an agenda, whether it is good or bad, it will move. And that's a place of um, government commitment. So don't underestimate the power of government committing to do a certain issue because when the government commits, they will find all ways of ensuring that there are resources and that the agenda moves as is required. And you can see that's the launch of the um, policy. Uh, the WHO was also present and we had several we had several people supporting the work. So also present uh, during this, um, during this um, launch, the CDC, the leadership at KNH. So when you have leadership supporting your work, it becomes easy. And it also gives you confidence as a person who's driving the agenda to continue implementing the interventions. So when you look at our national policy, this is available on the Ministry of Health website. You can look it up. The policy and the action plan are both available. We have five strategic issues and objectives that have been uh, uh, proposed to, to address AMR. One is public education and awareness, which we recognize is a big component. Number two, surveillance and monitoring. I've already talked about infection prevention and control, appropriate use of antimicrobials, and also the place of R&D. So when it comes to implementing a policy, it doesn't have it happen op overnight. Initially, we thought that by the second year, we would have made so much progress because everything seemed to be so easy when you look at it on paper. But you realize that every the ground shifts. When the rubber meets the road, the ground shifts in a big way. You realize you need to, to, to assess the fitness of your, of, your, of your intervention. You also realize you need to acquire resources. We had a zero budget. So that means you have no money, but you have a policy and a plan. You have activities that need to be done, but you don't have the resources that draws you back. You need to prepare your organization. So even as, um, as an, uh, as an uh, association or an organization or a movement like the, the Students Against Superbugs, you can have a plan. Is it funded? If it's funded, you will move faster. But if it's not funded, it takes you back. You need to prepare your implementation drivers, what will make you achieve more? You also need to prepare your staff or the people who are supporting the efforts. And when you start implementing your policies or your action plans, you get to a point you begin to adjust the implementation drivers. You begin to get more practical. If I wanted to reach 100 facilities in one year and by month six, I've only reached four. What does that look like in terms of my target and the reality? You need to manage change. People come and go. Leadership changes over time and every leader comes with their own um, area of interest. So you have to learn how to manage change. You need to deploy data systems because you want to see what's happening at the national level and initiate improvement cycles. So we are between year, year like uh, uh, four and five, actually three and four, um, uh, between initial implementation and full implementation. We are now we are monitoring implementation we are able to achieve um, fidelity and outcomes uh, benchmarks. We also are able to further improve on our outcomes because we have learned a lot over the last years. And again, to operationalize your plans, as much as you have a plan, you also need to operationalize your governance mechanisms, uh, make sure that these have been established at all levels, at the national level, at the county and facility levels. That's very important, complete with an m and &E plan for purposes of monitoring progress. So this is what um, our government uh, coordination mechanisms look like. What we like to emphasize is that um, the national action plan is a complex plan because it is made up of many other small plans within one big plan. You have sector specific plans like livestock, animal, animal plant and environment plans are also there. Things like water management are not a uh, um, and, and not uh, the mandate of the Ministry of Health, but you will find this in the National Action Plan. Crop production, food safety and quality, veterinary um, medicines, those are not Ministry of Health aspects, but you'll find these components within the National Action Plan that has been jointly developed. So if you don't have a clear coordination mechanism, it will be very hard to know whether actions are being achieved. So this is what our coordination mechanism looks like at the national level. We are governed by the National Antimicrobial Stewardship Interagency Committee. We have a um, strategic uh, uh, committee and we also have a technical committee.
So these are the ones that lead as a technical committee is made up of technical people, directors of the different um, uh, departments and the divisions and directorates. And then you have the um, a strategic committee that is actually um, made up of um, uh, the steering committee that is actually made up of uh, now the people who allocate resources like the principal secretaries make up the, the steering committee. Then you have intergovernmental relationship relations, knowing that this country has a devolved system, system of governance. We work through the council of governors. For us to reach the counties, we must go through the council of governors. And of course, all this work is coordinated by an AMR secretariat and supported by technical working groups, which are open to people who are interested, who have an expertise in different um, objective areas under the NAP, and they drive the work. And the same is replicated at the county level. Um, so if you look at, um, we also have clear term, terms of reference. You cannot be part of a committee and you don't know what you're supposed to do. So we have clear terms of reference that are developed for each uh, committee that is appointed. And again, we take advantage of our leaders who support us in advocacy for investment. One of the things that I will share with you that is that um, it's not very easy to mobilize for resources to implement a strategy, one. Number two, if your political leadership does not understand what you're doing, it becomes even harder because they decide where the money goes. And that is why leadership and advocacy must be continuous in any, uh, any work. And you can see like in this photo, we've had one of our very big champions who is in a high level leadership at the Ministry of Health, our chief administrative secretary, who we have gone with in too many meetings, advocacy meetings with the governors, with deputy governors, so that they're able just to agree and, and speak. Five minutes can make a difference. You don't need a whole day to engage a, a senior leader. If they can catch your vision within two minutes, they'll make a change wherever they are. And this is what happens when we engage um, uh, leadership at different levels. So what have we done in terms of implementation when it comes to awareness and understanding? We have a communication strategy. We've also developed some um, uh, policy um, briefs like this um, antimicrobial resistance is a policy brief. And right now, because of the upcoming World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, we have developed so many uh, IC materials, which I'll share with uh, Janice and Daniel. They can share with your teams. Uh, so that you can also help spread the word, just to be able to, uh, to spread awareness more. We even engage students, and uh, personally, I love to engage students, and I love being part of um, student movements because of the passion and the energy that students have. So throughout our World Anti Antimicrobial Awareness Week, we changed from antibiotic last year, antimicrobials, we've engaged students fully in these processes, and we are hoping that we can also be able to engage you during the upcoming um, WOW week. And you know, it's interesting when you interact with the community after you have made all this noise and now you think everyone knows about AMR and you go back to the community and this is a community in Nairobi and you ask them, have you heard about the antibiotic awareness? We can 72 tell you no, 72% say no. You feel like your bubble has burst, but uh, we keep talking about it until everyone gets to hear about it. And you can see what is happening within the community when we had a focus group discussion. And uh, one of the participants said that they visited a chemist, observed what was happening, and a 10-year walked in, a 10-year-old walks in and asked for, um, uh, for specific medicines. And he asked the provider, have we all become doctors? I used to see the doctor writing a prescription for us. The provider said that in Italy, there is no need for doctors. Everyone is a doctor. When you get such a statement from the community, I think as a healthcare provider, it speaks volumes. Either we have lost our, our trust and our confidence in the society, or there's something that we are not doing right. We also encourage the One Health Student Clubs, very important, and if you're part of a student club, a One Health Student Club, congratulations. If you are not yet part, please find out one in your institution and join. We've had very good skits and uh, also been able to reward uh, students that have excelled in terms of engaging in AMR. So for surveillance, a lot has happened. Now we have lab capacity that is being strengthened in about 18 laboratories. Data 
is uh, actually being submitted at the National Public Health Lab. So you have a National Public Health Lab, which hosts our national database for AMR. So we have data that is uh, now collected and actually this year we'll be releasing our first AMR report during the WOW week. We've also been able to map about 500 farms across the country to just understand the antimicrobial use in the vet sector. And we're also contributing to the global data um, base through the WHO glass system. Uh, and you can see there are different aspects of surveillance. Uh, you have one uh, which is lab specific, then you have surveillance for how much you're consuming and also surveillance on healthcare associated infections. So in terms of structures, of course, you can see uh, for the surveillance, it's very well coordinated, it's clear. We have a technical working group that is active and supporting this specific piece of work. I've already talked about what we've done in terms of establishing the reference centers, creating the lab network and um, building capacity as well for the healthcare workers. And we are hoping to scale up at least to 22 um, human health sites and seven uh, animal health sites by the end of next year. And when we do this, we don't just um, do it out of the blue, we are guided. And again, speaking to the importance of strategies because they standardize the approach towards any work. They make it easier for us to collect and generate very good data that can guide decision-making at a country level. So we have a, a, a dashboard actually that we are able to go into and check the status of every surveillance site. Are they reporting on data? Are they not reporting? And are there any challenges we are able to pick this out as well? And you've also embarked, like I said, you're building capacity for these labs through the support of implementing partners, improving the lab, uh, the, the microbiology labs in particular, providing equipment that is required so that we're able to fill the gaps that have been there with respect to the capacity to detect and report AMR. And apart from physical trainings, we actually started virtual training sessions as early as uh, 2017 within the AMR and IPC programs. And you can see that the, these particular programs have grown over the years. We started off with two sites and now we are at about 30 or 40 sites that participate on a biweekly call on uh, their building capacity for antimicrobial resistance. Um, so you can see the workload, it has uh, maybe not uh, been so great and that's why we need to keep engaging multiple teams. Uh, we expect more uh, higher workloads in each of these hospitals because of the kind of capacity that has been built in, in, this, in these facilities. So you can see it's very little workload in terms of retaining. Sometimes you get poor uh, quality data and after you clean the data, you can see the workload is even uh, lower. So you can see some of the preliminary results. If you have um, uh, a Cinetobacter and you have a 46% resistance to meropenem, which is almost a near last resort drug, you have 93% resistance to ceftriaxone by a Cinetobacter, you are worried. And, um, and I think because we have also misused ceftriaxone a lot, like you're going to see when I share data on antimicrobial use, it looks like everyone who goes to the outpatient with fever nowadays gets a, a shot of ceftriaxone, which is not guided or even um, uh, like recommended in the clinical guidelines that we have. So I've already talked about our contribution to the glass um, system. And you can see uh, the labs that submit data to our national coordinating center, which picks the data and shares it with uh, the international platform. So there have been challenges from IT capacity in our health facilities to the human resources in terms of turnover, inconsistent supplies, all these are challenges to surveillance and underutilization. Sometimes you can buy all these things, but because the clinical teams are not fully on board, they end up underutilizing the resources that are available to them. Our third objective is infection prevention and control. We have a national policy and plan this is our third edition of the IPC policy and plan. We have a, a, a robust country program. And now at the, uh, at the county level, we're also building the county IPC programs. And we want to advance infection control as a career in the country. So we are currently developing an MSc course in hospital epidemiology and infection prevention and control. 
we also adapted an on-site and online mentorship platform for the last like four years. And in animal health, we are now working on farm hygiene standards, biosecurity, biosafety standards, and also the adapting the international standards for OIE and Codex. So you can see in terms of capacity, when we did our assessment at country level last year, um, when we were just in the middle of responding to COVID, the overall IPC score at country level was about 62% and our target was 80. And you can see very basic things like hand hygiene, uh, scoring poorly, training, and um, the, uh, the availability of guidelines and standards was also a big challenge. Monitoring basic infection prevention and control indicators like hand hygiene. And I pick hand hygiene because this is one of the simplest, most effective in infection prevention and control interventions that can actually reduce the transmission of um, infections in our healthcare setup by up to 80%. When we did the baseline in this hospital, it was at 3%. 3% means uh, out of 100 uh, op opportunities to perform hand hygiene, the healthcare providers in this facility only did that three times. And uh, I will ask you to reflect when you go to a hospital, does the clinician wash their hands before they touch you? Do they clean their hands with an alcohol-based hand wrap, for example? And I just want you to type yes or no to that uh, question. Before they touch you, do they wash their hands with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand wrap? So just type for me yes or no, and we will see where we are at. So when it comes to optimizing the use of antimicrobials, that is where our antimicrobial stewardship falls. We have guidelines, again, that guide our work um, and, uh, and uh, support the healthcare facilities to establish their stewardship programs. We've also conducted a point prevalence survey in about six hospitals just to understand what the treatment patterns look like. And now we have incorporated AMS modules into pre-service training. So uh, the School of Pharmacy now has an AMS course, which is good. And you also have guidelines for prudent use of antibiotics in animals. We've also tried to assess what um, at country level, what that looks like. And in a study, a recent assessment that was conducted early this year, we found that 70% um, of all the antibiotics we are using, this was just in 16 hospitals, at least 70% belonged to the access category, which is good. WHO recommends that at country level, at least 63% of all antibiotics should be from the, used should be from the access category. We have categorized antibiotics into three classes, access, watch, and reserve, based on um, the capacity or the potential of developing resistance to these antibiotics by uh, microorganisms. So some that are in reserve category, like um, colistin, like meropenem, or linezolid and tigecycline, all those are reserve antibiotics. The watch, some of our uh, antibiotics like levofloxacin and azithromycin belong to watch. Then you have those that are easily accessible and many people don't like using them. And I know like during the COVID-19 response, a lot of people used to walk around with azithromycin thinking it's a magic drug and yet it had absolutely no effect against the virus. So the point prevalence surveys, remember what I, did, I, taught, I, I mentioned about safe triaxone and um, the resistance pattern seen to it. Um, in any of the three hospitals that were surveyed, at least 5% had antibiotics administered to them. And the most commonly used antibiotic was safe triaxone. And then also look at amoxicillin clavulanic uh, acid. Uh, people like augmenting so much and you can see what that, at, um, uh, is like in terms of consumption. Again, you're able to look at the commonly prescribed antibiotic classes by department. That's the beauty of a point prevalence survey. So that when you target your intervention, you know, am I going to focus on the ICU? Will I focus in the gynecology ward? Am I going to the newborn unit? But if you don't understand, like I said, without a situation analysis, your interventions are not targeted. Same to Rift Valley, you can see commonly uh, uh, prescribed antibiotics. So the people in this healthcare facility are able to propose actions. 
So at the county level, we are encouraging counties to develop county specific action plans. Just the same way we developed um, country specific action plans following the, uh, the adoption of the global action plan on AMR. We are now engaging with counties and asking them to adopt the national action plan and contextualize it to their own counties. And you can see some of the counties that have already launched their county action plans like Nyeri and Bungoma. Definitely there are challenges. Um, it's not easy to coordinate multi-sectoral programs because you have multiple players, leave alone the partners, but just making sure you're moving on the same pace or at the same pace with the colleagues in agriculture and environment. And for many years, the colleagues in environment were not fully on board until recently. Looking at partner coordination, you have multiple implementing partners, supporting different objective areas, and sometimes the support is not well uh, streamlined. How do we argue out that it is important for the government to invest in AMR? The outcomes are not well prescribed or described because of the scarcity of data that we have had across all the objective areas. And then the skills in terms of human resources, like I mentioned earlier, again, are still a challenge. So as I wind up, there are some lessons that um, we have learned leading this program from the national perspective. And I will also say this to you because you will step into leadership positions at one point. Many times we say we want to avoid the politics, but I can tell you political support and stability is key in the process of developing a policy and even actual implementation. Uh, just think about the decisions that MCAs make. We don't like them very much, but they make many decisions at county level. Even the governors who are political appointees in their own counties, they have the power to either support or not support an initiative. So that support is very important. Identify and clearly define the AMR burden in whichever level you are in. And then when it comes to policy formulation, you need to understand the policy environment. Like I said, policy doesn't happen overnight. The formulation process requires a lot of stakeholder engagement, analysis of the problem, a lot of consensus building and joint planning for ownership and ease of implementation. And when you have a, um, a, a, an agenda like AMR, whose root cause does not lie in any single sector, the multi-sectoral approach will definitely work best. So working towards establishing a multi-sectoral coordination mechanism is very important. And again, have a, a, a develop a realistic work plan. It's good to be ambitious, but sometimes we say realistic work plans are better because they help us to focus support from, uh, for many of our implementing partners. And then we also know that resources are important. When you have a plan and you don't have the workforce and the funds, nothing moves at the end of the day. So as I want to acknowledge all the many partners that support our work. And I think this is my last slide and I hand it over back to you, Janice. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Evelyn, for that wonderful presentation. I'm sure we've all learned a lot of things. I see some of the responses, yes, during COVID regarding hand hygiene, rarely, no, no. So that's like a no, very rare. So you can see basic things like hand hygiene and we are not able to adhere to that becomes a big problem. So I'll stop here, Janice, and hand over the meeting back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evelyn, for that uh, wonderful presentation. I'm sure we've all learned a lot of new things. Personally, I didn't know that we have um, action plans developed at like county um, level. I can't hear you, Janice. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evelyn, for that uh, wonderful presentation. I'm sure we've all learned a lot. Yeah, personally, I didn't know that we had um, action plans at county level. I think that's very impressive and it will go a long way in helping to fight the antimicrobial resistance. So if you have any question, kindly, you can put it in the chat box or um, raise your hand so that um, you can get an opportunity. Daniel Wambua. I'm not sure if you have a question or something. You can just uh, feel free to unmute in case you have a question. Uh, okay, in the meantime, I also I also have a question, Dr. Evelyn, about the policy formation process. Okay, so um you said it took like 10 years. So um 
did it take that long? Okay, uh, did the leadership contribute to it taking that long, like leadership at the political level contribute to it taking that long? And also as a um, pharmacist, what, what opportunities do we have in such like a platform? Dr. Evelyn? Sorry, Janet, I missed your question. So I'm, I'm asking about the policy formation process. You said mm -hmm. it took like um, 10 years. So um, yeah. I'd like to know if uh, the leadership like at the political level contributed to it taking that long. And also as a pharmacist, like what opportunities do we have in such like such a process? Okay, thanks Janice. Um, I will say it took long for two reasons. One, when a problem is not clearly framed, the people you present your problem statement to might have a hard time understanding the impact of the problem on the society. And I think that was one of the big, uh, that was one, one of the big obstacles. The researchers and the academicians knew there was a problem, but, but, the, but they were packaging it in such technical terms that uh, even if they presented these papers and published the leadership, most of the time at the, at the highest level probably are not um, technical people and they might not be able to pick out what the problem is and the impact. That was one reason. Number two, again, we didn't have a platform at the Ministry of Health at that point to really be able to engage. And that is why I talked about the place of dissemination. So the technical people used to meet and talk about their issues. But at the national level, we didn't have a platform, but we found an opportunity within the infection prevention and control program. So we used this now to advocate for AMR as a program to be established. So the packaging, so even as you advocate for AMR, what messaging are you taking out there? Either people will understand it or not. And that's why we kept saying we are preaching to the choir. Everyone is converted, they all understand. But when it comes to the people in leadership in different areas with different capacities, it becomes a problem. So as pharmacists, we definitely have a lot of opportunities. I'm a pharmacist, uh, let me say that. And I took advantage of my knowledge and expertise in drugs because there, is, there isn't any other profession or any professional or any cadre that will, will be able to articulate MR issues as well as pharmacists will do. So I took advantage of that and um, and, uh, and I think that is what enabled me to, to, to be able to lead the establishment of the program. You can articulate a lot of issues and I, that is one, because of your understanding, you're able to fit into multiple spaces, not just in drugs, but also in public health. If it's in pharma, if it's in infection control, if it's in R&D, you understand this field better. So if you're able to articulate your issues, then it gives you an opportunity. Number three, um, the passion you have for what you believe in and your work also opens up opportunities. These opportunities are always there, whether it's in the Ministry of Health, whether it's in institutions, whether it's in NGOs, the opportunities are there, but sometimes you have to, to, to push yourself beyond your limit. And I'll give you an example, and I'll tell you this, that an opportunity will not find you where you are. You will go out and look for it. And I remember walking into an NGO and moving from my facility because I believed what I was doing was important and no one was giving me attention. So I walked into and asked for the, the, the leader of the program and I had an opportunity to explain myself and say, this is what I think I can do and I need this support. And I've done that not once or twice, but it has become my way of doing things. If uh, you don't understand what I'm doing or I feel I don't get enough support, I walk into an office and explain my issue. And that has always opened up opportunities for me. So be on the lookout. These opportunities are there right now, opening up left, right, and center. Different NGOs, different institutions um, have uh, opportunities for AMR, even for students. Again, you have an opportunity of participating in our technical working groups, like the one for awareness and education you can play a key role. If you're interested, and I always say, Dan walked up to us and said, this is what we think we want to do. And I, I thought students against superbugs, okay, that's a good thought. So when people are, are find that whatever you're doing is going to add value, they will support you. 
So when you spot an opportunity, you have to go for it. That's what I say. Don't wait for it to locate you. Find it. And if it's not there, create it. And I've been part of creating opportunities. This um, portfolio within the Ministry of Health was not exist ex existent uh, by 2014. When I was posted there in 2015, it's because I had advocated for it. So sometimes you see an opportunity that no one else sees. I walk right up to the leadership and tell them, this is what you have identified as a gap and this is what you can do by virtue of your expertise as a pharmacist or by virtue of your training. You can create your own opportunities. And, and this, when this happens, uh, more often than not, you'll find that you will be successful because you actually know what you're, you're looking for. So I think that's my best advice because sometimes even if I send you vacancies, what would be your motivation? That's a question I ask. And, uh, and when you have that uh, motivation clear for you, uh, the doors will open and uh, the opportunities are, are I, I only say they are limitless. You can't exhaust them across all the objective areas. You just need to pick one and follow through. And when you find a mentor, the better, because I have grown because I identified mentors early on in my, uh, my line of work, AMR. That's like 10 years ago. I found a mentor who has kept me on toes and always uh, directed me when uh, opportunities were available. And when I was not sure about career growth, I also managed to reach out to them. So identify a mentor and let them help you um, grow in your career path. I hope that helps Janice. And I can see a question, what is the plan for engaging vet pharmaceuticals and agro vets? We are working with the Ministry of Agriculture very closely. And they have a very clear plan in terms of engaging the vet uh, pharmaceuticals and the agrovets. They are part of our, our target groups, just the same way for the Ministry of Health. We are targeting pharmacies and uh, those that are in community practice through the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. The vet sector has the Kenya Veterinary Association. They, want, they have an association for, for paravets. They also have the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. Um, and of course, the, the, division, the, the, the Department of Veterinary Services within the bigger ministry. So that is um, what I can say. And also through their associations. So the plans are ongoing. And like now during the WOW week, we have farmer field days. So we are moving beyond the para professionals and the professionals to even the farmers themselves. Thank you. Janice, I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, Dr. Evelyn, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. So we have a, a request here. Um, someone is asking if you could kindly share your presentation. Yes, I'll share my presentation. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure if we have any other question. I don't think we have any other questions. So um, let's just give one minute to Daniel to just say something small. Daniel? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Janice, for, for coordinating the session. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, championing this series. It, 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 it's, it's very impactful, you know, to see that at least we have, uh, you know, we have colleagues who are really championing for this. Uh, Dr. Ibli, I love what to say, uh, because I can picture your situation at the moment. You are very busy planning the you know, the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, there are so many activities, but despite all these activities, you still make time, uh, you know, to attend a, such a session, you know, just a request from uh, one of us, and uh, we really do appreciate, we don't take it for granted seeing you here. I'm sure that you have so much, and your passion is a great inspiration to uh, many of us, and I'm sure some people in the session, you've touched some people, and I'm sure next time we'll have about around, you know, maybe three or more people reaching out to you uh, so that you educate us more. Please never tire. We really uh, enjoy the sessions, and I'm sure that we'll all take action. Please let's all be ambassadors. Uh, let's spread the message what you've learned today. Uh, share with your colleagues in your different institutions. Yeah, and let us spread the word. Thank you so much, Dr. Aplin. Thank you, Janice, and thank you to all our participants. I really do appreciate it. And the recording will be shared. Thank you. Over to you, Janice.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much, Dr. Evelyn. We're very grateful. And we've come to the end of the meeting. You can leave at your own pleasure. Thank you. Uh, before we leave, Janice, I can see there's a question from Faith. Uh, she asks... Uh, I will answer you, AMR does not only involve pharmacists. Like I said, it's multisectoral. So if you want to look at lab surveillance, for example, who does lab work? It's a lab technician. Who does the diagnosis? It's the clinicians. You have the medical officers, you have the clinical officers. Who ensures that the patients in the ward gets their, get their medicines? It's the nurse. So it's really a multidisciplinary, it's a multidisciplinary, um, issue when it comes to who is involved. Anyone in the medical that, that takes care of the patient is actually involved in this process. It's not an issue of the pharmacist. But when it comes to pharmacy actions, for example, the establishment of a stewardship committee, the people who drive the stewardship committees are pharmacists because you require, a, you require drug expertise. If it's in the medicines and therapeutics committee, the secretary to the MTC is a pharmacist. So you can see the central role that pharmacy plays in this whole process. But when it comes to tackling MR, we require all the health professionals. You require a functional lab. A, pharmacy cannot work, a pharmacist cannot work in the lab. They cannot be lab techs. They are not trained to be lab techs. A pharmacist will not be the one who is going to do, um, who's going to do the prescription, the diagnosis, you know, to determine what kind of test this patient needs to undertake. That's the work of the clinician. So the clinical team will be there and they will call out to the pharmacy to find out what's the best treatment option. And the pharmacist is not the one who stays in the ward to ensure that the patient has actually taken their medicines. That's the work of the nurse. So you can see that actually it requires everyone who's involved in the continuum of care for the patient for it to be successful. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Evelyn. So, um, even mm. as we come to the end of the meeting, okay, I think we have one more question from Daniel. From Daniel. Yeah, on a personal so, healing, mm -hmm. we mm. have uh, we have stronger. Just one minute. On a personal feeling, we have stronger or stricter policy when it comes to import importation of drugs. Unfortunately, the same does not apply when it comes to use. What are your one minute? What are your what what did you say on this? Okay, so I agree with you, uh, Daniel Wambua, uh, on this. Huh? Policies are there, but when it comes to use, we have a problem, and that's that points to our weakness when it comes to the enforcement of law. We all know that antibiotics are prescription only medicines, but uh, what happens so that I can be the one who's going to self-medicate, who's going to demand for that antibiotic. So the enforcement is where we have a challenge. And um, I know it's a big problem that we, we, are, we have already started working on from the regulator's perspective, rescheduling of antibiotics, issuing public notices, but that's not enough. I always say responsibility starts with me. So what are we going to do differently as uh, professionals now that we know this is a problem? Because after you guys graduate, you might be the one who's going to be behind the counter for a few months before you stabilize. What will you do? If that patient walks up to you and asks for an antibiotic, will you dispense with all the knowledge that you have? Or will you prescribe unknowingly? So there's a place of regulation from the uh, National Medicines Regulatory Authority, which is our PPB. And there's also the place of self-regulation. So both must be balanced. Otherwise we end up with a problem when it comes to use. And of course, it, it actually ends with the patient. What kind of information are we giving them? Do we have enough time with them to cancel them on proper use of uh, the antimicrobials that we are prescribing? So there are multiple points, but largely self-regulation, of course, and the stricter enforcement from the regulator. Mm -hmm. Brian. Can we have different can we have policies to limit the number of different brands? This is tough because of the of the free market policy. You know, you have the trips agreement. So we tried to look at this, but it seems to be one of those things that is not so easy. 
because of international agreements that have been signed. But what we can ensure is that the quality of the different brands is good enough. Because remember, again, when you have more, then the cost also aspect is addressed. But when you have fewer, then the cost issue might be an issue. Remember what we are talking about, affordability and accessibility. But as long as you're able to assure quality, that is one of the areas that needs to be flooded. But in terms of limiting, that one is a tall order because of some of those international agreements that countries have gotten into, especially with respect to trade. Thank you. Yes, maybe just a question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sometimes, I don't know if it's even the right practice. Uh, I'm uh, uh, an animal practitioner. And we do get uh, times when maybe uh, there was a time maybe it was at night and I needed to do something. I needed to treat an animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did go to buy drugs from a human uh, pharmacy, mm -hmm. from a human pharmacy. But then there were drugs that it was hard for them to issue without prescription. I, I can't quite remember. It has been a while. It must have been atropine or something. And it was really... They, 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 really, they actually refused to, to give me the drug mm -hmm. until I proved I was a vet. So what does it take for antimicrobials to have that kind of enforcement? Like there's a, some specific drugs that it, it's really hard for anyone to give you over the counter without a prescription. Um, I think sometimes it's just uh, like what you said, what, can you, what do you think you can get away with? You see, I think that's where we've reached when it comes to self-regulation. There are things you will definitely not get away with, like dispensing of opioids, isn't it? Yes, yes, actually, yes. yes. So it, for me, at the end of the day, what I think is uh, critical as, um, as a practitioner is self-regulation. And because I know this is a prescription-only drug, and I think about the potential of misuse in the community, whatever you went to buy, probably at that point, the potential misuse in the community and the impact might have been greater than the, anti the amoxicillin you would have sold over the counter. You see, at the back yeah. of the mind of every person who is selling a prescription-only drug, I'm sure they weigh. What are the possible uses this particular person is going to is going to use this specific drug for? So it's self-regulation one and also assessing potential levels of misuse in the community. And then what would, what, what's a uh, um, possibility uh, that uh, I'm selling this to a person who is from a regulatory authority, for example. And that's why sometimes people are hesitant. They don't know who you are. But at the end of the day, like I said, self-regulation is very important. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Evelyn. Thank you, uh, people, for attending. Uh, I think we have one more question from mm -hmm. So Yeah, I see oh, I so many community pharmacies dispense opioid-based medicines without prescriptions. Brian, are you a pharmacist? Yes, I'm a pharmacy student. You're a pharmacist in the making? Yes. And remember what I've just said about self-regulation. Yes. And there's the, the big challenge here is um, balancing the money and, and the practice. Sure. Because at the end of the day, I want to, to sell. It's the sales. It's what is coming out. What am I getting at the end of the day? If I will just get an extra 1,000 by dispensing this prescription-only medicine without a prescription, Anyway, no one is seeing me, so I can do it. And anyway, I've done it for 10 years. I've never been caught. So you're the people who are going to help us to change this. And I talked about the place of self-regulation and the place of values. What do we value? And um, I, I got my, I'll say, I, like, I'll just share with you. I got my registration as a pharmacist in 2004. I have never list out my certificate to anyone. Even when I'm so broke, I need that money. That 40, 50K would be good for me. And I've had so many people coming to ask me for my certificate to go open a pharmacy. And I, the temptation is there, but I've said no. 
why am I saying that? It's not because I, I, I don't need money, but it's because of just the thought of imagining what is going to happen in that place where, where I have no influence over. You see, so self-regulation, actually all these things begin with you. Because today you might sell this uh, drug to somebody else, but remember you have relatives all over the country. Somebody else is going to handle them the way you're handling them today. And you will have no control over that. But what goes around definitely will come around. So I want to encourage self-regulation that even if the next door pharmacy is selling everything without a prescription, let your pharmacy be the unique one. It might look like you're not making money, but it all depends on how you interact with your patients and your clients at the end of the day. So I hope we are going to be the crop of professionals that are going to change practice so that we can say uh, pharmacy X, hospital Y has one, two, three professionals who are different. And you know, patients value that. They might not say it at the beginning. You might look like you're the bad one, but eventually they realize you're doing the right thing and they build confidence. That builds confidence in them regarding your services. Is that okay? That's okay. I know the money issue is a big thing, but we should get over it. Okay, Janice, thank you so much. It's been a, a great session. Have a good weekend. I know it's almost over. So once you hit Sunday, Monday is just around the corner. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>